I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm just fine, thank you. And now it's your turn. I'm just fine, too, thank you. My turn for what? Your turn to hear a joke. You tell me jokes by reading the funnies, so I'll tell you a joke by telling you a joke. Very well. What is it? Well, this old lady walked into this hotel, see? Yes. And this old lady walks up to this clerk, see? Yes. And this old lady says to the clerk, Will you please give me a room with a bath? Yes. And the clerk says, I can give you a room, but you'll have to take your own bath. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very, very good. Do you get it? Every Saturday night. Your what? My bath. Oh, <laughs> it's a very good joke. <laughs> like it. I just think it's so funny. I can give you a room, but you'll have to give yourself your own bath. <laughs> now will you please read me the funny? Buck the Comic yeah. Weekly. Very well, I'll read that in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly, and on the first page, under Bringing Up Father, Beetle Bailey. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. <whistles> toot me a toot and tweet me a tweetle. Squeeze out music for Bailey the Beetle. <whistles> At the army camp where Beetle is stationed, we're in the kitchen, and the captain is telling the cook, Hey, Cookie, I got a tip the general is coming to eat dinner with us and expect our mess hall. Oh, thanks, sir. I'll cook a special recipe. And five minutes later, the cook is carrying a kettle of stew to the stove. Oh, this will be a work of art. First, a little dash of salt. Then in the door comes Beetle Bailey. Hey, here's the salt you wanted, Cookie. Beetle trips over a pig. Whoops! I watch out for you! And he drops the sack of salt into the stew. Now look what you've done. When it's only salt, Cookie, and only five pounds. Oh! The cook sets down his kettle, picks up a box of soap chips. Last picture top row throws it at Beetle. You stupid idiot! The soap hits Beetle, bounces off him into the stew. Hey, now look what you did! First picture bottom row, the captain and the general walk in. Oh, my foot! Watch it, Captain! Uh... Sorry, sir. Uh, this visit is a nice surprise, General. The captain leads the general over to the table. Oh. Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, Cookie, uh, give the general a dish of your stew. Oh, but, Captain... Oh, come, come, Cookie. Let's see what you're feeding the man. Uh, if you desist, General. I do desist. Uh, insist. The cook ladles out the dish full of stew and sets it in front of the general. The general takes a taste. Ah, wonderful. I must have this recipe. Whereupon the captain turns to the cook. Write it out for him. Hey, but captain... Write it. Every step, just as you did it. Uh, every step? Yes, Cookie, every step. I want my wife to try it tonight. <laughs> General's at home in his kitchen and is reading the recipe to his wife, who is following the directions. Oh. Oh. After you trip and spill the salt, you'll drop in a box of soap chips. Soap chips? Yes, dear. Soap chips. And that's in order. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sakes, can you imagine the general telling his wife to trip and spill salt in the stew? Yeah. That's some recipe. Why, the poor wife, her knees will be all covered with bruises. Yeah, she'll have to do her cooking with pillows on her knees. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> <laughs> well, Beetle Bailey is funny, so anything that we learn from Beetle Bailey has to be funny. Yes. Well, now let's turn over the page and go past little Iodine and Prince Valiant 
and turn over page three, and here on page four is Walt Disney's The Sword and the Rose. Oh, yes, and I'm anxious to see what's going to happen because, you remember, this is in the early days of England, and Charles Bandon has rescued the Princess Mary, uh, who's the woman he loves, from that mean Duke of Buckingham, who's the man she hates. Yes, but the Duke of Buckingham has pursued them, and just as Charles Brandon and his friend Sir Edwin Caskerton had put Mary in a boat to row her out to a ship, the Duke galloped up on his horse and rode into the water and attacked Charles Brandon. And Charles Brandon is in the water way up to his waist, and the Duke had hit him in the back with his sword. I wonder what'll happen. Will Charles Brandon be killed? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with the sword and the rose. It's merry, merry England when knighthood was in flower. Music to bewitch our story hour. Brandon falls face forward into the water. Quickly, Buckingham dismounts to finish Brandon off. But Brandon is on his feet in a second. Sword in hand, he faces the Duke. Brandon parries the Duke's thrust and tries to work his way out of the water to shore, where he'll have surer footing. Last picture top row, he makes a sudden lunge and knocks the dagger out of Buckingham's left hand. And then, first picture bottom row, the two men are on shore. Brandon lunges at the Duke. Steadily, he drives the Duke back against the rocks. With the true skill of a born swordsman, he presses the Duke harder and harder. And then a quick thrust. And his sword pierces Buckingham's right shoulder. Last picture, Brandon stands over the wounded Duke and looks at him in contempt. I cannot be so merciful as to finish you. King Henry shall have that pleasure. Yes, he certainly knows how to handle that sword, doesn't yes, he? Yes, he does. Slash, slash, whish, slash. And Buckingham is beaten. Yes, just like that. Yes, just like that. Now will Princess Mary escape with Brandon and be married to him and live happily ever after? Well, maybe we'll find that out next week. But now let's look across the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes. And Roy's begun a new adventure. Yes, he met his friend Cube Root, who is quite an inventor. Yes, Cube took Roy to a barn where he has a laboratory, and he told him that he'd invented some silent explosives. That's right, TNT, an explosive so powerful that even a small amount of it can blow a building apart. But the difference is that this doesn't make any noise when it explodes. That's right. And just as Cube Root was telling Roy about the explosive... A masked man stepped into the door, gun in hand, and told Cube to hand the explosive over to him. Oh, I wonder what will happen. Will he shoot them or what? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Hi yip bye oh Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip bye oh The masked man stands directly under a metal pulley, gun in hand. All right, I want some of that silent explosive that Cube Root invented. Quick. But, sir, QTNT is my most valuable discovery. I've only a small quantity of it made up. I said I'm in a hurry. Now move. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Roy, holding his hands up, sees that his left hand is beside the rope that holds the pulley up to the ceiling. Come on, move. Hurry it up. Quietly, Roy loosens the rope. I said hurry. Last picture, top row, the pulley drops from the ceiling under the crook's head. <laughs> A second later, Roy has the outlaw's arms pinned behind him. Goodness gracious, Roy, how very clever of you. First picture, bottom row, Cube rips the handkerchief off the man's face. Wasp Bascom. Why, Roy, he purchased some of my cattle tonic last week. That's when I told him about my noiseless explosive. Oh, you faker. Six of my steers died from taking that stuff. And I aim to get even. No, no, Bascom is mistaken, Roy. My tonic is harmless. And I'll prove it by drinking some. Hey, now, don't be foolish, Cube. Stop. But it's too late. Cube has swallowed the tonic. Great sky, he drank it. Suddenly, Cube's face turns white. And he slowly sags to the floor. <sighs> hey, Cube. Cube. Roy goes to help Cube. Bascom picks up the keg of explosive and dashes out the door. Last picture. Roy whips out his guns and whirls around. No, no, Roy! Don't shoot! You hit the explosive, we'll be blown to bits! Oh, wasn't that too bad? Just when Roy had to 
Cloud lost captured, then Cube has to go do a silly thing like showing off and then get sick. Yes, and now Bascom is getting away with the TNT. I wonder if Roy will let him get away with it. Well, maybe we'll find out about that next week. But now let's turn over the page and see who's there. Oh, look, here's Flash Gordon, and he's gone all by himself to a strange planet to investigate. Yes, and while he was there, he met a strange hermit who seemed to befriend Flash. From the hermit's place, Flash could see a deserted city below. The hermit warned him that there would be danger there. But Flash said he was going down to investigate anyway. But as soon as Flash left, the hermit looked into the skies and said, Hear me, hear me. I'm warning you the Earth Man is coming. Now, I wonder what will happen. And does that mean danger for Flash? Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Flash Gordon. A rigga doon doon sashkamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash approaches the strange city. Well, here's the mystery city. Quiet enough. In fact, there's no one in sight. He moves toward the gate. When suddenly... Halt, stranger. Hey, what's that? Go no further. Flash stops, looks about. He sees no one there. He calls... I'm here on a peaceful mission. You can come into the open. Step toward the gate for identification. Flash advances, last picture top row, through the gate. He stops in amazement. Hey, what's this? Walls coming up out of the ground. First picture bottom row, he spins around and makes a dash for the open gate. And then, another one. Why, this looks like... Last picture, he turns to retreat. But now escape is blocked completely. A fourth wall, then a ceiling, slide into place. And Flash stands there, helpless. A trap. I'm trapped. Oh, that mean old hermit's gotten Flash into trouble. Yes, and he seemed to be so helpful to Flash. And now he's turned around and warned some mysterious person, and look what's happened. Sure. They knew Flash was coming and they got him trapped. Imagine being locked up in a little room just like you're trapped in a box. That's awful. What'll happen? Well, we'll find out about that next week. But now it's time to pick up the second section of the Comic Weekly. Oh, and there's that funny Dagwood. Yeah. I wonder what funny silly thing he'll do today. Well, I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ram a food, am a fum, zim, zim, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Down at the office, Dagwood is busy working. The office boy comes in. Hey, uh, Mr. Munstead, the boss just hung up a suggestion box on the hall. Hey, that's a splendid idea. And a few minutes later, the whole office staff is standing around the suggestion box. And Mr. Dithers makes a sweet little speech. Now, I want everybody to feel free to offer any suggestions that might be helpful to this office. Last picture top, everybody is working away at their jobs again. And then the door to Dagwood's office opens. And out comes Dagwood with a slip of paper in his hands. Straight to the suggestion box he goes. He drops his slip of paper into the suggestion box with a big smile on his face. I'll be the very first to use it. Half hour later, Dagwood is busy working at his desk. Suddenly a voice roars through his desk speaker. Momstead! Come into my office! Dagwood pops out of his chair and goes into Mr. Dither's office. <laughs> Mr. Dither, you sent for me? Ah, uh, yes, Dagwood, I did. Is this your suggestion that the office force be given two full summer months vacations like the school kids? Yes, sir, Mr. Dithers, that's mine. You! 
Last picture, second row, Dithers leaps for Dagwood. No, Mr. Dithers, no, no, have mercy, have mercy. Mr. Dithers, please, please, this is a young man. I've got a white man. First picture, third row, Dagwood, Tri-State Get Out. Mr. Dithers, please, please, have mercy. But Mr. Dithers, I... <laughs> and Dithers knocks him down with a typewriter. Again, Dagwood tries to get up. I meant it only as a... <laughs> And Dithers breaks the water cooler over him. Last picture, third row. Only as a gentle suggestion. <laughs> First picture, bottom row. Dithers' door opens and out sails Dagwood. <laughs> Now, Dagwood, although I don't agree with your first suggestion, I want you to feel free to offer others. Five minutes later, the door to Dagwood's office opens. Dagwood appears in the door. He's dizzy. One eye is black. His face is bruised. There are bumps on his head. His shirt is torn to pieces. He's aching all over. He staggers to the suggestion box. And drops in a letter. Then staggers back to his office. Closes the door and is seen no more. Ten minutes later, Mr. Dithers is at the suggestion box. He sees the note therein, takes it out, reads it. Whose suggestion is this? Suggesting that the suggestion box be removed. Uh-oh, here we go again. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Looks like poor Dagwood's in for another storm. I hope Mr. Dithers doesn't beat him up again. So do I. But I wouldn't guarantee he doesn't. Oh, poor Dagwood. The strangest things happen to him. <laughs> yes, they certainly do. Well, now let's turn over the page and go past Snuffy Smith and the Lone Ranger on page three. Turn over page three. And here on page four of the second section is Dick's Adventures. And you remember, Dick is in the early days of America, and he's gone to the White House in Washington with his friend Samuel Morse. Yes, that's right. Samuel Morse has been commissioned to paint the president's portrait. But Mr. Morse didn't want to do it because he didn't believe he could paint well enough. But Dick told him he should go ahead, and so he did. I wonder if it turns out to be a good portrait. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. Rickety pack a zack a zick. Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Weeks go by, and finally Morse finishes the portrait of President Monroe. The time comes when it is shown to everyone. Last picture, top row. Morse unveils it. Oh, that's wonderful, beautiful, a marvelous likeness. Everyone in Washington hails it as a masterpiece. But one old angry man looks at it and says, I disagree. This is no masterpiece. First picture, second row, the old man speaks up. I'm General John Trumbull, sir. You know my portraits of Washington, Hamilton, the Duke of Wellington, John Jay, and many others. I have a right to tell you, young man, that you'd make a better cobbler than an artist. Quietly, Morse nods, but Dick sees the black despair in his eyes. Suddenly, Morse lunges for his picture. He stops, stop, Mr. Morse. Hey, what are you going to do? What? I'm going to destroy it. I'll smash it to pieces. Oh, but you can't, sir. It's beautiful. Hey, now stop, sir. Stop. You have painted it. Let it stand. First picture, bottom row. The prompt action of Dick and John Trumbull saves the picture from destruction. The others leave the room. Morse stands quietly. He says to Dick, Art is long, Dick. If my pictures are no good, I'll destroy them. But I'll keep right on painting for the rest of my life. Hey, but wait a minute, Mr. Morse. Wait a minute. You've got to invent the telegraph. You've got to invent the telegraph. Last picture, Dick sits up in his bed. He sees he's in his own room in the world of today. And he says, Oh, gosh, I guess I was dreaming. Oh, I don't like that old man. 
After Mr. Morris worked so hard to paint a picture of the president, it wasn't nice of him to say it was no good. I agree with you, and he certainly shouldn't have said it in front of all those people. Well, I'm glad that Dick stopped Mr. Morris from destroying it. But I wonder what does Dick mean that Mr. Morris has to invent the telegraph? Well, maybe we'll find out more about that next week. Now look below Dick's adventures. There's Rusty Riley. Oh, and I'm anxious to read that, because you remember there was a theater company near the Milestone Farm. That's right, and one of the actors in the company stole a very expensive string of pearls from a wealthy girl who was acting in the show. And when he stole the pearls, he was dressed up in Rusty's coat and cap. And so some of the people have told the detective that Rusty was the thief. And after interviewing Rusty, the detective feels sure that Rusty is innocent. And he's gone to the home of the wealthy girl. And she didn't want to have Rusty arrested, but her mother does. I wonder what will happen. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. At Tweety's home, the girl is saying to her mother... Mother, think what you're doing. Having that boy Rusty arrested... Why, it could ruin his whole life. Stuff and nonsense, Tweety. He's just a young gangster. I never approved of Quentin Miles taking him from the orphanage. The detective stands up, hat in hand. I have to admit the circumstantial evidence is pretty strong against him, ma'am, but, um... Well, I'll have another talk with him. Meanwhile, at the Milestone Farm, in the barn, Rusty walks into the tack room. Tex looks up and says, Hey, what's wrong, Rusty? You look as worried as a new bride baking biscuits. Oh, golly, Tex, I'm in a terrible lot of trouble. I think I'm going to be arrested. Last picture, top row. Tex stands up and grins. Hey, now, arrested? What did you do? Rob a bank or hold up a mail train? It's no joke, Tex. The police think I stole a pearl necklace from the lady at the theater. First picture, bottom row. Rusty tells Tex the whole story. You see, Tex, Mr. Baker, the detective, he says that an electrician and a stagehand saw me outside Miss Castle's dressing room just after 4 o'clock. But, gee, I was on my way home with Dawn at that time. Only I can't prove it. No, no, no. Don't let it get you down, partner. The truth is a mighty powerful thing to have on your side. I reckon I'll mosey over to that theater and ask a question or two. Well, I wish you'd take these costume bags, Tex. I won't be using it now, and and please bring back my jacket and my cap and pants. And a short time later, at the playhouse, Tex is finishing a conversation with Mr. Fidgley, the director of the company. Why, yes, Mr. Purdy, I saw Rusty start for home with a horse about 3.30. Of course, um, he could have come back. Well, um, thanks very much, Mr. Fidgley. I'll get his things. You see, they're in Mr. Grant's dressing room. Yes, right down there, that door there. Thanks very kindly, sir. Tex goes into the dressing room. He sees Rusty's jacket hanging up on the wall. Well, I'll be a lop-eared jackrabbit. A coat hanger. In all the time I've been at Milestone Farm, I never seen Rusty put that jacket of his'n on a coat hanger. At last picture, in a tavern in the town, two men are talking. It's Shorty, who has just handed the pearls to the gangster. Now, this morning squares me with Mick. These pearls are worth at least three or four grand. In a legit sale, Shorty. But these here oyster eggs is hot. We got a deal with a fence. Oh, I'm glad that Tex knows all about this and is trying to help us. So am I, because already Tex has discovered an interesting clue that Rusty never hangs his jacket on a hanger. But... Shorty's given those pearls to another man already, and if they don't find the pearls on Shorty, will they be able to prove that Shorty was the thief? Well, that's something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. But now look across the page. There's Donald Duck. Oh, Donald Duck, good for a chuckle. Yes, sir, Ree. <laughs> we'll read your favorite favorite right now. Here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squee, jump, squee, jump, squiddly, chicka chick chick chick. Let's, Let's have, have music to better quack, quack. <laughs> It's early in the morning, and the alarm clock goes off. Yes, dear. Oh, oh, it's you. Well, uh, up and at him. And a 
half hour later, Donald goes in to wake up the boys. He looks at the bed and sees Huey, Louie, and the dog, and Dewey. He reaches over, pulls out the dog, drops him on the floor. Scram, pooch. Oh, gee, Uncle Donald. I've told you boys a dozen times. Don't let that hound sleep with you. Why, gee, Uncle Donald, he likes a nice bed. Half hour later, Donald is heading for the shopping district. Last picture, top row. Poor little guy. Soft hearted. Just like me. First picture, bottom row, Donald is standing in front of a pet shop. He sees a beautiful dog bed in the window and a price tag which reads, Deluxe dog bed, only $30. And 15 minutes later, Donald pulls up in front of his house again. He lifts out the deluxe dog bed. If you know kids and dogs, you can solve any problem. And five minutes later, he's showing the deluxe dog bed to the boys. Well, how do you like it, boys? Cool. Absolutely cool. And that night, last picture, just before Donald goes to bed, he stops in the boys' room to see if they're sound asleep. And there in the dog's bed are Dewey, Louie, and Huey. And in the boy's bed lies the dog, dreaming of dog biscuits. <coughs> and Donald goes. <laughs> Wasn't that a good joke on Donald? <laughs> yes, it really was. And he thought, if you understand kids and dogs, you could solve anything. Yeah, well, he solved this problem, but it didn't work out the way he thought. I should say not. This one turned out backwards. A lot of Donald's things turn out backwards, but I just love him. Yes, so do I. Well, now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Chronic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the Jolly Comic Weekly Man.